Theatre. Welcome to Limerick Writers' Centre Annual Literary Cabaret. We have everything for you tonight, from the very traditional to the very avant-garde. I have been agonising about whether to go to Pig Pound Fling or here. We've made the right decision. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful evening. There's music, there's words, there's film, there's everything. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our first act. I said avant-garde. It's Techno Mugs with Arthur Watson and Pat Stepp. <laughs> Module complete. I wandered lonely as a cloud. Part. I will arise and go down and go to Abbey Field. To Abbey Field. <laughs> <laughs> and as the red hand. A holster. Another red hand. A holster. I have one too. I have one also. Goodbye, Ian. <laughs> Good riddance, Ian. <laughs> it rhymes. I have poetry in my system. I can rise. I can rise. Uh, I'm up. Oh, now. During one of these lives, the canister kicker dies in a street below the motor pixel turning at the stair of a traffic light. With one year ahead of it before the crash, dolly, the tin can, Bang! above which the Bang! words like black anthracite novels with feathery fungus flickering in and out. Wow! Like that is a book. Salamanders on the slick beach of the tongue. Bring it, legs. Trumpeting <laughs> the coded message. Unreal. I, as the first leaves of autumn, I shall dismantle the minor matrix. Look what I'm doing. Look, free yourself now. Minor matrix is down. Now. For the major matrix. are gone. The matrix of God. Now, we can write and create real, original work. Not this look-alike stuff that's been going on for centuries. New perfection. Those two guys arrived so conventional, I had no idea. 
So, big round of applause for Arthur Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Can look at me now with disgust as I suffer for my sins here in the flames of hell. And why would I not suffer? For a poor man must sin to have what is rightfully his. Poor men will welt their hands and cripple their backs for the land. And there are those that would come and take what was mine. The field that I nurtured with the manure of seven heifers. And ye say I have no rights? By God, I tell ye this. No man would take what was lawfully mine. These flames of hell are hard to bear, but bear them I must. For what is a man if he doesn't stand for what is his? I'm not alone here in this abyss. There's the widow butler still dressed in black. And she a whore that would take the money of a black stranger and leave me without my field. Mick Flanagan, a conniving bastard. Honest auctioneer, there's no such thing. Didn't he take blood money to keep his mouth shut? His wife may be here too. Her husband wasn't the only man she lay with. Yes, Father Murphy, that righteous man. He too was scald here for his sins of the flesh. Ah, the bishop too, another virtuous man, would dare to preach of greed and wrongdoing. And he that would take the innocence of an altar by. Poor Willie Day must suffer hell, for his greed condemned the bull to this torment. Willie's wife here too, for no man should have to suffer the torment of a woman's crazed mind. The bird sits on his bar stool, his lips cracked and parched, his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth, and near a drink to quench his thirst, a thirst unknown to any living man. Aye, they're all here, and at their pleasure must suffer for their wrongdoing. At least I stood for what was justifiably mine. And to bait your wife, what sin is that, I ask you? And she that would live a tinker's one-eyed pony, graze the grass of fourteen cows out from under their face. And hike my boy, why they didn't I show you a different way? But you understood the importance of the land. And I, I'm glad your mother's not down here with us. She's with the man above. She had her share of suffering done and out. To have married a man like me that would murder a tinker's ass. And to have spawned a son that would kill a man. I, Ty, that's torment enough for any woman to bear. So all of ye that would look at me and condemn me for what I've done, Look into your souls and ask, would ye too take the field from the bull McCabe? Thank you very much. We're an evening where we're going to have English, Irish, and a little French, and it's time for a little French now. Uh, Martin and Patsy are going to come out, and Martin will explain to you the story of Edith Pia. Maintenant, et à quelques moments, dans la compagnie d'Edith Pia. C'est Patsy McCoy qui va interpréter les chansons que nous avons choisies. Um, Patsy will give, I think you will find, a very uplifting rendition of the music of Pia. <laughs>
aren't lovely, fragrant, pretty. They're cold and sinister, dark and deep. Treacherous underfoot, dank and shitty, and home to every kind of creep. Beyond the black and amber coil, Death played hide and seek and found lay far exotic places Mount Rath, Dublin, Moscow, Kathmandu, behind the station at Bird Hill and home. This was my Rubicon, my Cape Bocador. The 22nd 
to nine and ten to four, throbbed by familiar fields in cool and Latin, before bolting into the vast uncharted through the eye of Kilmastella Bridge. In time, I grew, horizons widened. The bridge diminished to a thin zigzag bypassed by engineers whose concrete tunnel shoulders with ease the grinding juggernauts. I, too, bypassed for years until curiosity led me by the hand to that out-of-the-way meander, now hatching potholes, weeds, and refuse. Below... Uh, Father and a daughter, Shona Cusper and his daughter Mayla. Sean is a Connemara based poet, he writes in Irish and English. His poetry is inspired by rural and cultural themes and sometimes reflects on a past life. So, Shona Cusper and his daughter Mayla. So, let's pray together the woods. Took a drum, our neen, Mach Nano, or Lach Wee, our Hallow Malicha, no Lach Mahunchi. Arachas the Nord, her ache is awo. It's gone twidim the Ross that who call in the Tiwarata, love the Lishan Scott, and that had Bala draw. Ni hock crochet farrier, ain lean, la rota, few months go off, and loch on the Gotsafora. A quin on soul and tow at loch on the poor, dumb draw. in Limerick. Uh, he was a key member of the Dublin-based band Cisco, which produced a wonderful EP um, engineer, um, <coughs> produced by U2 engineer Paul Barrett. Since the breakup of the band, uh, Sean has released, continued as a solo performer to release numerous singles and albums. A new album, Cool Charisma, is released in September. I give you Sean <laughs> Standing in a line on your own You see him but you not really know Here's so many times all alone Looking for love But you never had any quest for romance The music plays but still you don't dance Are you waiting for a moment of chance? Will it be her? Could she be a Juliet? You are the headlines, yes, you are the news. You are the lonely eye, you are the prophet still to come. You are the young lines, yes, yes, you are the sun. You are the saviors of kingdoms to come. You are the bravest, you are the ones that we need. You are the greatest, you are the kings and the queens. Don't let them get you, don't let them into your mind. Don't let them get you, don't let them pull out your eyes. Don't be the blind led by the blind. Light. Then you slipped silently away Moving further from our love All we have are the pieces in our mind Of a world that says she's unexplainable Not as it seems In a chance there's a dream that's full of Dream that's full of song Calling us on and on, safe to the end. We don't even know your name, but we glad you came along. We don't even know your name, but we glad you came along. We're heading for a beautiful star. Our second act in the second half is Fergus Costello, the irrepressible Fergus Costello. Fergus.
Fergus is a singer-songwriter, but he's also a performance poet, recently crowned the Munster Grand Slam uh, Poetry Slam winner. He will go on to represent Munster in Kilkenny at the national finals. In the Irish Times, we describe him as a crafter of hilarious comedy monologues. And he's claimed an impressive number of prizes. I advise you, listen carefully to get the best from this. Fergus Costello. Before you remained up on stage, still stomping, holding nothing back, still leaking relentlessly, Tommy Cooper like, still shadow playing for us with the tattoo lady, and with every killer riff and lick showing us beyond question that pure passion flowing into performance can be a thing of unforgettable beauty, yeah. But it wasn't all. Fun and games on the road, you know, it wasn't all rock and roll. When the lights were switched off, all of us dispersed. Rory was left trying to find his own way home, wrestling with those tricky devil in the detail, ambiguous bits of his unique, almighty, giving gift. Did you ever wake up with those bullfrogs on your mind? Rory. Now we have um, two people going to come up to the stage and talk about a very innovative approach to poetry and getting out there amongst the public. We've got Dr. Breed Wallace and Sheila Fitzpatrick as well. They're going to come up and speak. At the same time, we'll get the screen down and we'll have a, a little slide over there. Then we'll move on to the final part of the evening. Now we're not going to do too much talking, just simply to say some of you may have seen a tatty old armchair popping up in various locations all over the city and been wondering what the hell is going on. Well, the, the following slideshow will give you a brief uh, glimpse of what's actually happening. It's our guerrilla poetry project called Reading at Random. Okay. And in it, you will see some familiar faces in some familiar places. Enjoy. 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 Enjoy.
best of luck. We gather they're going on an international tour next Saturday. It's a wonderful approach. We're now at the last phase of the evening, and we turn particularly joy to see you. If you go to Dublin for Blues Day, let me recommend that you don't go there next year. If you want a much better Blues Day, come to Brock. Blues Day in Brock is so much better. You might wonder why we have Blues Day in Brock. Joyce's best friend at university was George Clancy, the mayor of Limerick, who was murdered by the Black and Tans in 1922. Um, Clancy was one of the few people that Joyce, we, Joyce was a very arrogant man, that he really got on well with. Clancy persuaded him to go to uh, Gaelic League classes. There's another connection. Finns, the Finns who ran the pub, and I don't think it's there now in Limerick, the pub is still there, uh, are the same family who had connections with Finns Hotel in Dublin, where Nora Bloom worked before she left the door. In one of the short stories, no, sorry, in the middle of Ulysses, um, Joyce made another reference to Limerick. He called a scurrilous dog that chased Leopold Bloom out of the pub Gary Owen. So there's a connection there. The first part of this sort of trilogy is the reading of the original story. Zeb Moore, who many of you know, <coughs> an actor, co founder of Magic Roundabout Theatre, and a crucial part of the Richard Harris Film Festival, is going to read the original story. Then Carl Finnegan, who is the producer director of the film, will come out. Then we'll look at the film itself. But enjoy the joys here in the community. The grey, warm evening of August had descended upon the city, and a mild, warm air, a memory of summer, circulated in the streets. The streets, shuttered for the repose of sunlight, swarmed with a gaily coloured crowd. Like illuminated pearls, the lamps shone from the summits of their tall poles upon the living texture below which changed shape and hue in seasonally, sent up into a warm grey evening air on unchanging, unceasing northern. Two young men came down the hill of Rutland Square. One of them was just bringing a long monologue to a close. The other, who walked on the verge of the path and was at times obliged to step onto the road, owing to his companion's rudeness, wore an amused listening face. He was squat and ruddy. A yachting cap was shoved far back from his forehead and the narrative to which he listened made constant waves of expression break forth over his face from corners of his nose and eyes and mouth. Little jets of wheezing laughter followed one another out of his convulsing body. His eyes, twinkling with cunning enjoyment, glanced at every moment towards his companion's face. Once or twice he rearranged the light waterproof which he had slung over one shoulder in Theodore fashion. Where will we meet? Half ten, answered Cordy, bringing over his other leg. Where? Corner of Million Street. We'll be coming back. Walking all right now, said Lenehan in a farewell. Cordy did not answer. He sauntered across the road, swaying his head from side to side. His bulk, his easy pace, and the solid sound of his boots had something of a conqueror. He approached the young woman and without saluting began at once to converse with her. She swung her umbrella more quickly and executed half turns on her heels. Once or twice when he spoke to her at close quarters she laughed and bent her head. They were walking quickly, the young woman taking quick short steps while Corey kept beside her with his long stride. They did not seem to be speaking. An imitation of a result pricked him like the point of a sharp instrument. He knew Corey would he knew it was a no-go. They turned down Bagger Street, and he followed them at once, taking the other footpath. When they stopped, he stopped too. They talked for a few minutes, and then the young woman went down the stairs into the area of the house. Corley remained standing at the edge of the path, a little distant from the front steps. Some minutes passed. Then the hall door was opened slowly and cautiously. A woman came running down the front steps and coughed. Corley turned and went towards her. His broad figure hid horse from view for a few seconds, and then she reappeared, running up the steps. The door closed then, and Corley began to walk swiftly towards Stevens' room. Lenehan hurried on in the same direction. Some drops of rain fell. He took them as a warning, and glancing back towards the house which the young woman had entered to see what was he observed, 
He ran eagerly across the road, anxiety and his swift running made him panic. He called out, Hello, Carly! <coughs> Carly turned his head to see who called him. Friend of the Gates School of Acting, artistic director of his own theatre company, producer and director of the short film you're going to see, and I'm delighted to introduce the Castle Troy Boy, who's come back to Limerick for the first showing of this short film, Carl Finnegan. It's great to be home. It's, uh, I left when I was 14, so this is the first day I've come back. I'm originally from uh, Maldean Heights, and when I, I, I'm always reminded, my friend says to me, you know, we always remembered you in, your, in our school in Dublin because the minute you arrived, you lost your accent in two weeks. So there you go, that's how we lost it. Five from, uh, from Limerick, so it's great pleasure for me to bring the film here, you know, thanks to, to Donald, who is co-producer on the project, but also championing the project constantly on Twitter and social media, and wants to bring joys to, to younger people. And I think Bloomsday and Brook is a great thing, so please come to the next one. I am available, I'd like you all to come to that too. And I suppose I'll introduce the film. What I'd like to talk about first as well, I'll keep it brief, is that um, you know this is a group of independent Irish filmmakers. You know, this is our first film and you know it's been made very you know inexpensively uh, at a professional level and um, you know i'm very very happy with it and i'm just very moved by the fact that people have come together and make it happen and some people are here tonight they've traveled down to see it so we have john carey who plays lenin uh, the lead in this film and we have patrick brooks the assistant director and if it goes down well you know we might invite them up just to during the credits for a bit of applause if you like it and was there anything you'd like to say? The final thing is, you know, when you're updating this piece, you're sort of, you're wondering how you're gonna do it. We spent a lot of time, you know, it was very similar to the original story at the beginning and it changed a lot as well. Um, I like to think of the film as representing spiritual descendants of the original characters. And I'll be, int I'll be interested to hear what people think. So I'll be around later. So please, you know, if you have any, any feedback on the film, please do that. to say thanks for coming <laughs> thanks guys so thanks very much and it was good of carl to bring back to Lynn for the first showing in the film a few thank yous just before we finish with the final song first to you as an audience thank you so much for coming to the artists who've given us their time tonight to Gary, who's acted as stage manager, who's been stage manager, ably assisted by Caleb. Caleb had the misfortune to be at the White House last week and was asked then, and he's come along and worked really hard tonight. You've got a warm-up part. <laughs> <laughs> 